A.H. Archibald Hapwood Brubaker lived in a house of bones. Jaw bones, hip bones, femurs. There were bones in every room, every closet, on the back, back porch. Some people have stone cats on their roofs. On his roof, Archie Brubaker had a skeleton of Monroe, his deceased Siamese. Take a seat in his bathroom, and you found yourself facing the faintly smirking skull of Doris, a prehistoric creodont, an animal that lived millions of years ago. Open the kitchen cabinet where the peanut butter was kept, and you were face to fossil face with an extinct fox. Archie was not morbid. He was a paleontologist, a scientist who studies the bones of animals. The bones were from digs he had done throughout the American West. Many were rightly his, found in his spare time. Others he collected from museums, but slipped into his own pocket or knapsack instead. Better to sit in my refrigerator than disappear in a drawer in some museum basement, he would say. When he wasn't digging up old bones, Archie Brubaker was teaching at universities in the East. He retired at the age of 65. When he was 66, his wife, Ada May, died. At 67, he moved himself and his bones west to join the other fossils. He chose his, homes for, his home for two reasons. One, its proximity, or how close it was, to the high school. He wanted to be near kids. He had none of his own. And two, Senor Sagaro. Senor Sagaro was a cactus, a 30-foot tall giant that towered over the tool shed in the backyard. It had two arms high on the trunk, one stuck straight out. The other made a right turn upward, as if waving, adios. The waving arm was green from the elbow up. All else was brown, dead. Much of the thick leathery skin along the trunk had come loose and crumpled and heap about his massive foot. Senor Sagaro had lost his pants. The outer skin of the giant cactus had fallen down like a man's pants. Only his ribs, thumb thick, vertical timbers held him up. Elf owls nested in his chest. The old professor often talked to Senor Sagaro and to us. He was not certified to teach in Arizona, but that did not stop him. Every Saturday morning, his house became a school. Fourth graders, 12th graders, all were welcome. No test, no grades, no attendance record, just the best school most of us had ever gone to. He covered, or he taught us about, everything from toothpaste to tapeworms and somehow made it all fit together. He called us the loyal order of the stone bone. He gave us homemade necklaces. The pendant was a small fossil bone strung on raw hide. Years before, he had told his first class, call me Archie. He never had to say it again. After dinner that day, Kevin and I walked over to Archie's. Though the official class convened, or met, on Saturday morning, kids were welcome anytime. My school, he said, is everywhere and always in session. We found him, as usual, on the back porch, rocking and reading. The porch, bathed in the red golden light of sunset, faced the merry copas. Archie's white hair seemed to give off a light of its own. The moment as he saw us, he put down his book. Students! Welcome. Archie, we said, then turned to greet the great cactus, as visitors were expected to do. Senor Sagaro, we saluted. We sat on rockers. The porch was full of them. So, men, he said, business or pleasure? Are you here to talk about something serious or something fun? Bafflement or confusion, I said. There's a new girl in school. He laughed. Star girl? Kevin's eyes popped. You know her? 
Know her, he said. He picked up his pipe and loaded it with cherry sweet tobacco. He always did this when settling in for a long lecture or conversation. Good question. He lit the pipe. Let's say she's been on the porch here quite a few times. White smoke puffed like Apache signals from the corner of his mouth. I was wondering when you'd start asking questions. He chuckled to himself. Bafflement. Good word. She is different, isn't she? Kevin and I burst into laughter and nods. At that moment, I realized how much I had been craving Archie's confirmation. Kevin exclaimed, like another species. Archie cocked his head, as if he just caught the sound of a rare bird. The pipe stem anchored a wry grin. A sweet scent filled the air about our rocking chairs. He stared at Kevin. On the contrary, or actually, she is one of us. Most decidedly, she is us more than we are us. She is, I think, who we really are or were. Archie talked this way sometimes, in riddles. We didn't always know what he was saying, but our ears didn't much care. We just wanted to hear more. As the sun dipped below the mountains, it fired a final dart at Archie's flashing eyebrows. She's homeschooled, you know. Her mother brought her to me. I guess she wanted a break from playing teacher or someone else to teach Stargirl sometimes. One day a week. Four, five, yes, five years now. Kevin pointed. You created her? Archie smiled, puffed. No, that was done long before me. Some people are saying she's some kind of alien sent down here from Alpha Centauri or a distant star somewhere far away. Or something, said Kevin. He chuckled, but not too convincingly. He half believed it. Archie's pipe had gone out. He relit it. She's anything but. She's an earthling if there ever was one. So it's not just an act, said Kevin. An act? No. If anybody is acting, it's us. She's as real as. He looked around. He picked up the tiny wedge-like skull of Barney, a 60-million-year-old Paleocene rodent, and held it up, as real as Barney. I felt a jolt of pride, or I felt proud, at having reached this conclusion myself. But the name, said Kevin, leaning forward, is it real? The name, Archie shrugged, every name is real. That's the nature of names. When she first showed up, she called herself Pocket Mouse. Then Mud Pie. Then what? Holly Golly, I believe. Now, Star Girl. The word came out whispery. My throat was dry. Archie looked at me. Whatever strikes her fancy. Maybe that's how names ought to be, huh? Why be stuck with just one your whole life? What about her parents, said Kevin. What about them? What do they think? Archie shrugged. I guess they agree. What do they do, Kevin said. Breathe, eat, clip their toenails. Kevin laughed. You know what I mean. Where do they work? Mrs. Carraway, until a few months ago, was Stargirl's te teacher. I understand she also makes costumes for movies. Kevin poked me. The crazy clothes! Her father, Charles, works. He smiled at us. Where else? Where everyone else works. Micatronics, we said in chorus. Or we said together. I said it with wonder, for I had imagined something more exotic or unusual. Kevin said, so where is she from? A natural question in a city as young as Micah. Nearly everybody had been born somewhere else. Archie's eyebrows went up. Good question. He took a long pull on the pipe. 
Some would say Minnesota. But in her case, he let out the smoke, his face disappearing in a gray cloud. A sweet haze veiled the sunset, cherries roasting in the merry copas. He whispered, Rara avis, rare bird in Latin. Archie, said Kevin, you're not making a lot of sense. Archie laughed. Do I ever? Kevin jumped up. I want to put her on hot seat. Dorko Borlock here. Leo Borlock is being stupid and doesn't want to. Archie studied me through the smoke. I thought I saw approval, but when he spoke, he merely said, Work it out. Decide what to do together, men. We talked until dark. We said adios to Senor Sagro. On our way out, Archie said, more to me than to Kevin, I thought. You'll know her more by your questions than by her answers. Keep looking at her long enough. One day, you might see someone you know. <laughs>